All right, all right. Uppity the corn here with um, the 25th. Uh, I don't know what to call this episode or series, um, 25th video of Malcolm in the Morning. I apologize for how short 24 was. I didn't expect it to go that way, but you know how I, I just move with, you know, I just move with room going, hey, summer lady, it's very good to see you here. I'm trying my best to keep my little my little dress together. Um, it's so funny. Um, the date here that I'm about to read about is February 13th, and today is February 12th. And this is the anniversary of my son's birth and death. He was born February 12th, 2013. Um, so it's just a very special day to me. I didn't even realize I was putting myself um, in a black dress. But nevertheless, you know, uh, coincidences aren't really coincidental at all. Mood Music, I'm so happy to see you here. And M. Davis, it is always good to see you around Mood Music. I recognize you, so I am going to go on ahead and add you as a moderator. And um, if you see any insulting, you know, comments, feel free to use your wrench how you would like. So that being said, <clears throat> On February 12, 1965, Malcolm X returned home from a trip to the European continent where, among other things, the French government had without explanation barred him from entry. A few hours later, at 2.30 a.m. on February 14, Molotov cocktails were hurled into the home at East Elmhurst, Queens, where Malcolm, his wife, and four young children were asleep. The house was seriously damaged, but the family managed to escape without injury. And the following week, Malcolm actually had to defend himself against hints and charges spread by the police, the press, and the Black Muslims that he had arranged the arson bombing himself. Malcolm was scheduled to speak on the day of the bombing at a meeting in Detroit sponsored by the Afro-American Broadcasting Company. Although he was fatigued and distraught, he felt it necessary to appear at this meeting which the local press had refused to publicize in any way. Uh, now here is Malcolm's uh, speech. Attorney Milton Henry, distinguished guests, brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, friends and enemies. I want to point out first that I am very happy to be here this evening and I'm thankful to the Afro-American Broadcasting Company for the invitation to come here this evening. As attorney Milton Henry has stated, I should say brother Milton Henry because that's what he is, our brother. I was in a house last night that was bombed, my own. It didn't destroy all my clothes, but you know what fire and smoke do to things. The only thing I could get my hands on before leaving was what I have on now. It isn't something that made me lose confidence in what I'm doing because my wife understands and I have children from this size on down. This size on down. And even in their young age, they understand. I think they would rather have a father or a brother or whatever the situation may be who will take a stand in the face of, in the face of reaction from any narrow-minded people rather than to compromise and later on have to grow up in shame and disgrace. So I ask you to excuse my appearance. I don't normally come out in front of people without a shirt and a tie. I guess that's somewhat a holdover from the black Muslim movement, which I was in. That's one of the good aspects of that movement. It teaches you to be very careful and conscious of how you look, which is a positive contribution on their part. But that positive contribution on their part is greatly offset by too many liabilities. Also, last night when the temperature was about 20 above and when this explosion took place, I was caught in what I had on, some pajamas. And trying to get my family out of the house, none of us stopped for any clothes at that point. So we were out in the 20 degree cold. I got them into the house of a neighbor next door. I thought perhaps being in that condition for so long would get, they would get pneumonia or cold or something like that. So a doctor came today, a nice doctor, and shot something in my arm that naturally put me to sleep. I've been back there asleep ever since the program started in order to get back in shape. So if I have a tendency to stutter, slow down, it's still the effect of that drug. 
I don't know what kind it is, but it was good. It makes you sleep. And there's nothing like sleeping through a whole lot of excitement. Tonight, one of the things that has to be stressed, which has not only uh, the United States very much worried, but also has France, Great Britain, and most of the powers who formerly were known as colonial powers worried, and that is the African Revolution. They are more concerned with the revolution that has taken place on the African continent than they are with the revolution in Asia and in Latin America. And this is because there are so many people of African ancestry within the domestic confines or jurisdictions of these various governments. There is an increasing number of dark-skinned people in England and also in France. When I was in Africa in May, I noticed a tendency on the part of the Afro-American to what I call lollygag. Everybody else who was over there had something on the ball, something they were doing, something constructive. Let's take Ghana, for example. There would be many refugees in Ghana from South Africa. Some were being treat, uh, trained in how to be soldiers, but others were involved as a pressure group or a lobby group to let the people of Ghana never forget what happened to the brother in South Africa. Also, you had brothers there from Angola and Mozambique. All of the Africans who were exiles from their particular country and would be in a place like Ghana or Tanganyika, now Tanzania, they would be training. Their every move would be designed to offset what was happening to their people back home where they had left. When they escaped from their respective countries that were still colonized, they didn't try to run away from the family. As soon as they got where they were going, they began to organize into pressure groups to get support at the international level against the injustices they were experiencing back home. But the American Negroes or Afro-Americans who were in these various countries some working for this government, some working for that government, some in business, uh, they were just socializing. They had turned their back on the cause over here. They were partying, you know. When I went through one country in particular, I heard a lot of their complaints and I didn't make any move. But when I got to another country, I found the Afro-Americans there were making the same complaints. So we sat down and talked and we organized a branch in this particular country of the Organization of Afro-American Unity. That one was the only one in existence at that time. Then during the summer, when I got back to Africa, I was able in each country that I visited to get the Afro-American community together and organize them and make them aware of their responsibility to those of us who are still here in the lion's den. They began to do this quite well. And when I got to Paris and London, there are many Afro-Americans in Paris and many in London. In November, we organized a group in Paris, and within a very short time, they had grown into a well-organized unit. In conjunction with the African community, they invited me to Paris Tuesday to address a large gathering of Parisians and Afro-Americans and people from the Caribbean, and also from Africa who were interested in our struggle in this country and the rate of progress that we have been making. But the French government and the British government and this government here, the United States, know that I have been almost fanatically stressing the importance of Afro-Americans uniting with Africans and working as a coalition, especially in areas which are of mutual benefit to all of us. And the governments in these different places were frightened. I might point out here that colonialism or imperialism as a slave system of the West is called is not something that is just confined to England or France or the United States. The interests in this country are in cahoots with the interests of the interests in France and the interests in Britain. It's one huge complex or combine. And it creates what is known not as the American power structure or the French power structure, but an international power structure. This international power structure is used to suppress the masses of dark skinned people all over the world and exploit them of their natural resources. So that the era in which you and I have been living during the past 10 years, most specifically has witnessed the upsurge on the part of the black man in Africa against the power structure. He wants his freedom and now, mind you, the power structure is international and its domestic base is in London, in Paris, in Washington DC and so forth. The outside of our external phase of the revolution which is manifest in the attitude and action of the Africans today is troublesome enough. The revolution on the outside of the house or the outside of the structure is troublesome enough. 
But now the powers that be are beginning to see that this struggle on the outside of the black man is affecting, infecting the black man who is inside that structure. I hope you understand what I'm trying to say. The newly awakened people all over the world pose a problem for what is known as Western interests, which is imperialism, colonialism, racism, and all these other negativisms or vulturistic isms. Just as the external forces pose a grave threat, they can now see that the internal forces pose an even greater threat. But the internal forces pose an even greater threat only when they have properly analyzed the situation and know what the stakes really are. Just advocating a coalition of African, Afro-Americans, Arabs, and Asians who live within the structure of automatically have a uh, uh, structure automatically has upset France, which is supposed to be one of the most liberal countries on earth, and made them expose their hand. England is the same way, and I don't have to tell you about this country that we are living in now. When you count the number of dark-skinned people in the Western Hemisphere, you can see that there are probably over 100 million. When you consider Brazil has two thirds of what we call colored or non-white in Venezuela, Honduras, and other Central American countries, Cuba and Jamaica and the United States and even Canada. When you total all these people up, you have probably over 100 million. And this 100 million on the inside of the power structure today is what is causing a great deal of concern for the power structure itself. We thought that the first thing to do was to unite our people, not only internationally, but with our brothers and sisters abroad. It was for that purpose that I have spent five months in the Middle East and Africa during the summer. The trip was very enlightening, inspiring, and fruitful. I didn't go into any African country or any country in the Middle East, for that matter, and run into any closed door, closed mind, or closed heart. I found a warm reception and an amazingly deep interest and sympathy for the black man in this country in regards to our struggle for human rights. I hope you will forgive me for speaking so informally tonight, but I frankly think it is always better to be informal. As I am, as far as I'm concerned, I can speak to people better in, in an informal way than I can with all of the stiff formality that ends up meaning nothing. Plus, when people are informal, they are relaxed. When they are relaxed, their mind is more open and they can weigh things more objectively. Whenever you and I are discussing our problems, we need to be very objective, very cool, calm, and collected. That doesn't mean we should always be. There is a time to be cool and there's a time to be hot. See, you got messed up into thinking that there's only one time for everything. There is a time to love and a time to hate. Even Solomon said that, and he was in that book too. You're just taking something out of that book that fits your cowardly nature and you don't want to fight. And you say, well, Jesus said don't fight. But I don't even believe Jesus said that. Before I get involved in anything nowadays, I have to straighten out my own position, which is clear. I am not a racist in any form whatsoever. I don't believe in any form of racism. I don't believe in any form of discrimination or segregation. I believe in Islam. I am a Muslim. And there is nothing wrong with being a Muslim, nothing wrong with the religion of Islam. It just teaches us to believe in Allah as the God. Those of you who are Christians probably believe in the same God because I think you believe in the God who created the universe. That's the one we believe in, the one who created the universe. The only difference being you call him God and we call him Allah and the Jews call him Jehovah. If you could understand Hebrew, you would probably call him Jehovah too. If you could understand Arabic, you would probably call him Allah. But since the white man, your friend, took your language away from you during slavery, the only language you know is his language. You know your friend's language, so when he's putting the rope around your neck, you call for God and he calls for God and you wonder why the one you call on never answers. I want to say something really quick about what Malcolm just said as a person who has studied the Arabic language. If you're reading a Christian Bible in Arabic, whenever you see the word God, it is without a doubt going to say Allah. Back to the book, Elijah Muhammad had taught us that the white man could not enter Mecca and Arabia and all of us who followed him, we believed it. When I got over there and went to Mecca and saw these people who were blonde and blue eyed and pale skinned and all of those things, I said, well, but I watched them closely and I noticed that though they were white and they would call themselves white, there was a difference between them and the white ones over here. And that basic difference was this, in Asia or the Arab world or in Africa where the Muslims are, if you find one who says he's white, 
All he's doing is using an adjective to describe something that's incidental about him. One of his incidental characteristics, there's nothing else to it. He's just white. But when you get the white man over here in America and he says he's white, he means something else. You can listen to the sound of his voice when he says he's white. He means he's boss. That's right. That's what white means in this language. You know the expression free, white, and 21? He made that up. He's letting you know that white means free and boss. He's up there so that when he says he's white, he has a little different sound in his voice. I know you know what I'm talking about. Despite the fact that I saw that Islam was a religion of brotherhood, I also had to face reality. And when I got back into this American society, I'm not a, in a society that practices brotherhood. I'm in a society that might preach it on Sunday, but they don't practice it on any day. America is a society where there is no brotherhood. This society is controlled by primarily primarily by the racists and segregationists who are in Washington, D.C. in positions of power. And from Washington, D.C., they exercise the same forms of brutal oppression against dark-skinned people in South and North Vietnam or in the Congo or in Cuba or in any place on earth where they are trying to exploit and oppress. That is a society whose government doesn't hesitate to inflict the most brutal form of punishment and oppression upon dark-skinned people all over the world. Look right now what's going on in and around Saigon and Hanoi and in the Congo and elsewhere. They are violent when their interests are at stake. But for all that violence they display at the international level, when you and I want just a little bit of freedom, we're supposed to be nonviolent. They're violent in Korea. They're violent in Germany. They're violent in the South Pacific. They're violent in Cuba. They're violent wherever they go. But when it comes time for you and me to protect ourselves against lynchings, they tell us to be nonviolent. That's a shame because we get tricked into being nonviolent. And when somebody stands up and talks just like I did, they say, why he's advocating violence. Isn't that what they say? Every time you pick up your newspaper and you see where one of these things is written into it and I'm advocating that I'm advocating violence. I've never advocated any violence. I've only said that black people who are the victims of organized violence perpetrated upon the, us by the Klan, the citizens councils, and many other forms should defend ourselves. And when I say that we should defend ourselves against the violence of others, they use the press skillfully to make the world think that I am calling for violence, period. I wouldn't call on anybody to be violent without a cause. But I think the black man in this country above and beyond people all over the world will be more justified when he stands up and starts to protect himself, no matter how many necks he has to break and heads he has to crack. The Klan is a cowardly outfit. They have perfected the art of making Negroes be afraid. As long as the Negro is afraid, the Klan is safe. But the Klan itself is cowardly. One of them never come. Um, one of them never come after one of you. They all come together. They're scared of you. And you sit there when they're putting the rope around your neck. Forgive them, Lord. They know not what they do. As long as they've been doing it, they're experts at it. They know what they're doing. No, since the federal government has shown that it isn't going to do anything about, uh, about it but talk, then it is a duty. It's your duty and my duty as men, as human beings. It is our duty to our people to organize ourselves and let the government know that if they don't stop that clan, we'll stop it ourselves. Then you'll see the government start doing something about it. But don't ever think that they're going to do it on just some kind of morality basis. No. So I don't believe in violence. That's why I say I want to stop it. And you can't stop it with love. Not, um, not love of those things down there. No. So we only mean vigorous action and self-defense. And that vigorous action, we feel, we're justified in initiating by any means necessary. Now, for saying something like that, the press calls us racist and people who are violent in reverse. This is how they psycho you. They make you think that if you try to stop the Klan from lynching you, you're practicing violence in reverse. Pick up on this. I hear a lot of you parrot what the man says. You say, I don't want to be a Ku Klux Klan in reverse. Well, if a criminal comes around your house with his gun, brother, just because he's got a gun and he's robbing your house and he's a robber, it doesn't make you a robber because you grab your gun and run him out. No, the man is using some tricky logic on you. I say it is time for black people to put together the type of action, the unity that is necessary to pull the sheet off them so they won't be frightening black people any longer. That's all. And when we say this, the press calls us racist in reverse. Don't struggle except within the ground rules that the people you're struggling against have laid down. 
Why, this is insane. But it shows you how they can do it. With skillful manipulating of the press, they're able to make the victim look like the criminal and the criminal look like the victim. Come on, Malcolm. Right now in New York, we have a couple of cases where the police grabbed a brother and beat him unmercifully and charged him with assaulting them. They use the press to make it look like he's a criminal and they are the victims. This is how they do it. And if you study how they do it, if you study how they do it here, then you'll know they do it over there. You'll know how they do it over there. It's the same game going on all the time. And if you and I don't awaken and see that this man is doing to us, see what this man is doing to us, then it'll be too late. They may have the gas ovens built for you before you realize it. And they're already hot. FEMA. One of the shrewd ways that they project us in the image of a criminal is that they take statistics and with the press feed the statistics to the public, primarily the white public, because there are some well-meaning persons in the white public as well as bad-meaning persons in the white public. And whatever the government is going to do, it always wants the public on its side, whether it is the local government, state government, or federal government. You know, this is funny that Malcolm is saying this because this is pretty much why um Gail King went after Kobe because when you can't convict somebody in a court of law, so long as you can convict them in a court of public opinion, they're, they're just as good as guilty. Your reputation means so much. Love you, Miss Mona. At the local level, they will create an image by feeding statistics to the public through the press, showing the high crime rate in the Negro community. As soon as this high crime rate is emphasized through the press, then people begin to look upon the Negro community as a community of criminals. Y'all wonder why white people cry when they kill Harambe, the gorilla, and they kill, you know, uh, whoever, the lion. And then when an African-American gets shot unarmed in the middle of the street, there's no emotion. This is why. And then any Negro in the community can be stopped in the street, put your hands up and they pat you down, might be a doctor, a lawyer, a preacher, or some other kind of Uncle Tom, but despite your professional standing, you'll find that you're the same victim as the man who's in the back alley, just because you're black and you live in a black community, which has been projected as a community of criminals. And once the public accepts this image, it also paves the way for a police state type of act activity in the Negro community. They can use any kind of brutal methods to suppress blacks because they're criminals anyway. Right. And what has given us this image? The press again. By letting the power structure or the racist element in the power structure use them in that way. A very good example was the riots that took place during the summer. I was in Africa. I read about them over there. If you notice, they referred to the rioters as vandals, hoodlums, thieves, and they skillfully took the burden off the society for its failure to correct these negative conditions in the black community. They took the burden completely off the society and put it right on the community by using the press to make it appear that the looting and all of this was proof that the whole act was nothing but vandals and robbers and thieves who weren't really interested in anything other than that which was negative. And I hear many dumb brainwashed Negroes who parrot the same old party line that the man handed down in his paper. It was not the case that they were just knocking out store windows ignorantly. In Harlem, for instance, all of the stores were owned by white people. All of the buildings are owned by white people. The black people are just there paying rent, buying groceries, but they don't own the stores, clothing stores, food stores, any kind of stores. They don't even own the homes that they live in. They are all owned by outsiders. For these um, and for these rundown apartment dwellings, the black man in Harlem pays more money than the man down in the Rich Park Avenue section. It costs us more money to live in the slums than it costs them to live on down on Park Avenue. Black people in Harlem know this and that white merchants charge us more money for food in Harlem and it's the cheap food, the worst food. We have to pay more money for it than the man has to pay for it downtown. So black people know that they're being exploited and that their blood is being sucked and they see no way out. When the thing is finally sparked, the white man is not there. He's gone. The merchant is not there. The landlord is not there. The one they consider to be the enemy isn't there. So they knock out his property. This is what makes them knock down the store windows and set fire to things and things of that sort. It's not that they're thieves, but they, the newspapers, are trying to project that image onto the public that this is being done by thieves and thieves alone. And they ignore the fact that it's not thievery alone. It's a corrupt, vicious, hypocritical system that has castrated the black man. And the only way the black man can get back at it is to strike it in the only way he knows how. 
When I say they use the press, that doesn't mean that all reporters are bad. Some of them are good, I suppose. But you can take their collective approach to any problem and see that they can always agree when it gets to you and me. They knew that the Afro-American Broadcasting Company was giving this affair, which is designed to honor outstanding Black Americans, is it not? But you find nothing in the newspaper that gives it the slightest hint that this affair was going to take place, not one hint. Though there are supposed to be many sources of news, if you don't think that they're in cahoots, watch. They're all interested, or none of them are interested. It's not a staggering thing. They're not going to say anything in advance about an affair that has been given, any, uh, given by any Black people who believe in functioning beyond the scope of the ground rules that are laid down by the liberal, by the liberal elements of the power structure. And I'm going to start there and stop there and um, read your comments. So we'll begin again on page 168. <sighs> Let's see. M. Harper says, big facts. Very, very soothing. Thumbs up always. Hello, Miss Mona. Hey, Taryn Harry. Harry. Uh, Josh Burns. I'm Davis. All right. So we're all good here. So I'm going to go ahead and end this. I'm up at a unicorn. I thank you for listening. And I'm out.